action. We are live at Sifta for Rosh Chodesh Women's Circle Chodesh Vat. Welcome to all the new women. Thank you to our um, nutritionist of the day, Hannah Rothberg. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. Okay, so today's class is about the secrets of the month of Shvat, the secret energy of the month of Shvat, according to Sefer Yitzirah. In today's class, we're going to be discussing the Kabbalah of food and five levels of eating that we can grow with because eating food takes up at least 80% of our waking hours, if not more. Thinking about food, preparing food, eating the food, cleaning up the food, serving the food, then working off the weight from the food, buying clothes to fit us from the food, etc. So because food takes up such a big part of our life, we are, want to get the most out of it. And the time to do this is in the month of Shvat. Shvat is very connected to the inner experience of eating. So join me today for five levels of eating. Um, let us begin. So why is Shvat the month that we elevate our food? So it actually goes back a very long time. First of all, the name of Shvat comes from the Akkadian, Akkadian name of Sabatu, which means heavy rains. Um, Shvat is a time of heavy rain. And Shvat, notably, the only Jewish Chag in Shvat is what? Tubi Shvat. What do we celebrate on Tubi Shvat? The, the birthday of the trees, the fruit trees which nourish us. By the way, for in honor of Shvat, mm -hmm. I got um, these fruit earrings for the fruit month of Shvat. So the, um, why is the birthday of the trees specifically the month of Shvat? Um, the reason is because we learn fruit trees, as opposed to vegetables, have one growth cycle a year. Vegetables can have a few growth cycles a year. You can keep planting and growing vegetables. Fruit trees grow, produce fruit once a year, similar to humans. Humans are connected to fruit, to trees, specifically fruit trees. Um, and this growth cycle begins in Shvat. What happens in Shvat? The, the veins of the trees begin to absorb the water from the ground into the veins of the trees and start the new growth cycle of the fruit in this time of Shvat. So it's interesting because the fruit cycles begin in Shvat, which actually has a lot of halachic implications, specifically during Shemitah, because in the Shemitah year, in the seventh year of Shemitah, you're actually allowed to eat the fruit in the beginning of the year because the fruit are from the last year's growth cycle from the sixth year. And the fruit cycle of Shemitah only begins in Shvat. So really it's the eighth year that we're not eating the fruit cycle from the previous year. So it's interesting to know, it's halachically important to know when the fruit growth cycle begins. So that is what we celebrate in Shvat. It's interesting that we're celebrating it specifically on Tubi Shvat, on specifically the 15th of the month of Shvat, because the, we learn, we keep learning throughout this class that in, we're celebrating the Jewish months, which were literally given to Am Yisrael as a mitzvah in this week's parsha. The first mitzvah given to Am Yisrael is blessing the new month. Hashem takes Moshe outside, look, tells him to look at the sky and says, do you see the new moon? Which he couldn't see because there is on the first day of the month, it's just a slither. You could barely see it. And to say, when you see the beginning of the new moon, that's the first of the month. And all the Jewish Chagim are counted according to the cycle of the moon. And the rest of the world goes according to the sun cycle, but we go according to the moon cycle. Okay, so that was to bring us back to Shvat, to understand that we follow the cycles of the moon. And in every month in the Jewish calendar, there's a shifting of the energies. We learn this from Sefer Yitzira, that every month Hashem shines a different type of energy. We have this ability and this magic that Hashem gives us that in each month of the year, the letters of, Hashem creates the world through his letters, Yud, Hei, Vav, and Hei, which are actually the secret of the Eitz HaChayim. So we have this um, connection to the, the to the tree in the letters of Yud, Hei, Vav, and Hei. Um, and every month, Hashem's light of the, the Hashem's letters shine in a different order. And in this month, the letters of Hashem's name shine in the order of Hey Vav and then Hey Yud. I'll tell you why that's why, why that's so interesting because the there's a secret there's a hint in that to Tu Bishva. In the Hey Yud, we have the fifteenth Hey and Yud in Gematria is fifteen, and then the Hey and Vav is eleven. What is fifteenth of the eleventh of the fifteenth? Shvat is 11th month and 15 is the 15th. So there's a hint in this month to the power on the 15th of the month. So the energy of this month is the energy of tasting, of the inner experience of tasting godliness and tasting divinity in the food that we eat. And last month, it was experiencing anger in our body. Before that, it was sensing sleep. Before that, it was smell. In each of these months, these energies flow. And the, key, the, the highest manifestation of the energy of the month is when the moon is the fullest. So it follows the cycle of the moon. So on the 15th of every month, when the moon is at its fullest, we have the full manifestation of the energy of that month at its peak, which is so interesting because on the 15th of this month is when the full manifestation of tasting divinity comes to its peak and we celebrate the birthday of the trees and the, the whole connection of human beings being like trees and our growth as well. So Teves, um, and we have this in every single one of the Jewish months that the peak of the month is on the realized and actualized on the 15th of the month. Which other months do we see that the Chag is that the high Sukkot is on the 15th of the month, Pesach is on the 15th of the month, and Tuba Av is on the 15th of the month of Av. So we see this constantly throughout, throughout the month. So that's just something interesting to note. The full moon is when you get the full 
the full experience of the of the month. So going back a little bit, we're going to connect now to the the we spoke about the important dates in this month of Shvat. We have the 15th of the month is to be Shvat. We have on the first of Shvat, which is tomorrow, Moshe translated the Torah into 70 languages. We also have a couple of interesting of Chabad dates. One of the biggest Chabad dates is the 10th of Shvat when the Rebbe took on the leadership of becoming the Rebbe and the previous Rebbe passed away a year before that. It's like the day when the Rebbe became Rebbe, so it's a big Chabad date. 20, the sec, 22nd of Shvat is when the Rebbe's wife passed away and that's when the convention for all Chabad Shulchas around the world, um, thousands of Chabad Shulchas go to New York, hopefully I'll be going, to sell it, to have this um, international convent conference for Chabad Shulchas. The letter of the month is a letter of, look at your sheets guys, Sadik. Sadik is beautiful, is unique, and compared to this month because Sadik, both in its regular form and in its final form, look like um, a tree. They both have a branch, they have the leaves on top of the Sadik, and the Sadik itself has the roots as well. And that's what makes up with the three components of a tree. It has to have roots, a branch, and um, a trunk, and a and the branches. We're, we'll present our vote as Hashem, and we're going to talk about that in two. Now we're going to talk the, the the zodiac sign of this month, the astrological sign of the month is... Aquarius. Anyone here in Aquarius? Aquarius is a wonderful sign. So Aquarius is the air sign of the earth months. We learned that these three months of Teve, Shvat, and Adar are Asav months because Asav, when they divided the months, Asav got these months, which tells that they have tremendous potential this month because Asav comes from Tohu. There's a lot of potential in these three months and they're earth months, which are very practical growth oriented months. This month, especially because we're planting in the earth. Um, and the Aquarius is an air, it's, it's interesting because Aquarius is an air sign. It has water in it because the meaning of Aquarius, the sign of Aquarius is the water carrier. In Hebrew, it's the Deli, which is the bucket. And the Bnei Saskar talks about the month of Deli, and he says that it represents Judaism, the Jewish nation, more than any other month of the year. Because he says that a Jew is a pail, a bucket, a water carrier. Because what a bucket is, what a Jew's essence is, is that a bucket wants to be full. A bucket is a vessel that's waiting to be filled to completion. And then to pour out and to give. And he says, that's what a Jew is. A Jew is a vessel created that is waiting and yearns and to be full with as much as it can. And a cup of water or a bucket that's not filled to the top is, is not meeting its potential. That's why when adults, we pour water, right? We pour it till here. When a kid pours himself a cup of milk or a cup of juice, right? It goes like till the top because a child understands that a cup should be used to its full potential. Why am I having a full cup? What's the point of it? And we we recognize this by Kiddush, right? Who pours Kiddush till the very top? We grew up that not only do we pour it to the top, but you have to actually spill over because that's what a Jew is. A Jew is a cup that should be filled with everything that Hashem wants to give it, all of its potential, and not only be full, but spill over to others. And that is our goal. That was our Shifa. And that represents, that's the true, of this, um, that's the true inner meaning for why Jews are represented as hungry for more, as wanting more. The Jew is, um, the, the, the anti-Semites will call it greedy, or the merchant of Venice will say a Jew just wants more and more, which is true. A Jew always yearns and wants more and more and more. A Jew is never satisfied. He is a bucket that unless he's full to the top and spilling over to others, is never satisfied. And that's the deeper reason why a Jew will never be happy, with what he, never be enough what he has. And not just spiritually, materialistically, a Jew always wants more. Because a Jew understands in his essence that the reason that the, that the reason that he has materialistic things is to elevate the spark of in it. Like my favorite Hayom Yom says that Hashem created the world from ayin to yesh. Hashem made yesh from ayin, made something from nothing. And a Jew's job is to take that yesh and turn it back into ayin, which means that we take all the materialism in the world that is, comes to our way, any materialism that we find, anything physical, any um, encounter that we experience, and we turn it back into ayin. We reveal the divinity in it. Hashem took away the, Hashem hid it and took the divinity and made it into something physical. And we take that physical thing and make it back into something spiritual. So we take our physicality and turn it into spirituality. That's what the essence of a Jew is. So we're a bucket waiting and yearning to be filled with all the materialism that we can have so that we can elevate it and bring it back up. That's what water is, right? It flows. A bucket of water is water that comes down, rain that comes down, and then it evaporates back into, into the cloud. And that is what exactly what we are. We are a water carrier that is a bucket that needs to be filled. And this specifically happens in the month of Shvat. And Aquarius is the month to have the high, the most growth more than any other month. Last month in Tevis, we said we're creating our vessels. Tevis was about creating our potential, planning our potential. The Capricorn plans for the future, has goals, sets their goals. We create vessels. And in Shvat is a time we fill those vessels, the bucket, with with growth and with life. That is what happens in the trees in this month. The trees nour are nourished from the ground. They want to begin their growth process. So the highest growth, the greatest growth that we have 
isn't this month a shot? It's a time to take all of the growth, all of the waters, everything we have and fill up ourselves and continue growing and nourishing until we're overflowing. Like I love to say from Oprah, may your cup runneth over. Everyone should be so full that your cup should runneth over. And you should think about that every time you pour Kiddush, pour a lot and envision yourself being so full with everything, all the blessings, materialistically, spiritually, everything, so that you're so full that you runneth over and can share that with the world. And the point of a cup is not just to be, the whole reason that, thank you, <laughs> the reason we have a bucket is not just to have fullness and it stays there, right? Anyone who just, if the water's full and stays there, what happens? Gets moldy and smelly, right? If you leave a cup of water for too long, it has to keep pouring out and then refilling itself. That is the point of a bucket. A water carrier that just has a bucket that stays there ain't, ain't getting no business, right? Anything in life, if somebody is wealthy and then they just have all the wealth for themselves and they don't do anything with it and they have everything they can ever have and then they're just sitting with themselves, those people are the most unhappy, miserable people in the world. Those are the deeply unhappy people. The joyful people are people that receive and give and receive and give and constantly give and replenish themselves. So that is the blessing and the avoda of this month to make ourselves an open vessel, to be open to receiving practice putting your hands out like this more often when anyone blesses you when someone's making a bracha when you make a bracha make put your hands like this to be an open vessel to receive all of the influence from this month what the bracha yeah my, my, this is what i learned if you ever see anyone standing like this it's to make yourself an open vessel because your hands are the receivers without the way that's how we take things we take things with our hands so practice opening your hands to receive more bracha when someone when you make a bracha anytime you want to receive if you're standing outside and it's raining do this to receive the bracha because rain is blessing and Shabbat is blessed with rain. Um, Shabbat, um, the specific, we'll get to the moment. So that is the mazel, the mazel, the astrology, the dali, the Aquarius, the pale. Did I bring you a pasuk about dali? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's our thirst and our hunger. It says, Dalu enai la marom. My eyes are worn looking to the heavens to ask Hashem, I mean, be, my, be there for me. So it's looking up and asking Hashem to bring out the rain, to absorb it from the bottom absorb the waters the nourishment from the ground and to be open so this is really the best time for um manifesting for growing in the best way growing like a tree becoming your greatest tree and flourishing producing your fruits this is time to be productive this is a productive month for am israel so this is one more our moon is full and we're it's a time for productivity anyone feel that in this month they're like ready to be productive like anyone feel like a, a desire to be productive a desire to do more to have more to acquire more to like be yeah. more, what? You're here. <laughs> right. And I'm like, to get out more, to just oh no, actualize. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else feeling like a desire to self-actualize more during this month? An inner, an inner pull, an inner push to desire to, to self-actualize? <laughs> this month, specifically. No, I'm saying in this month of Shvat. Yeah. Well, Shvat didn't start yet, guys. Shvat starts tomorrow. Shvat starts tomorrow. Well, in Eretz Yisrael, we tap into the energies of a Kedusha in a more direct way. Everyone gets them, but they come first here. Hashem shines. I feel like, oh, this month is all about klipa. What does klipa mean in Hebrew? Appeal, a shell. So this month, we're uncovering the klipa of all the food that we eat, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. So I just to, on a side note, I feel like in Eretz Yisrael, there's less, I feel like there's less klipa. Hashem made the world. If he revealed himself in the previous worlds of Tohu, the world shattered because there's so much revelation. It's like by Harsinai, when Hashem spoke to us, we all died from the revelation. So when Hashem created our world, he made a lot of klipot. Our world is called the world of hell and the coverings of a world of klipa, where Hashem put many layers to cover himself, like a peel covers what the fruit is inside, so that we don't die every time we see the Kedusha. So we don't expire from the revelation. And this, and, and Eretz Yisrael, I, what I, my, my, I feel like when we're in Israel, there's a little bit less klipa. There's a little bit less coverings of Hashem's light. I feel a little bit more like I could connect to the energy and the spirituality more here, less coverings, a less pull to materialism here. Shira, you feel that here? Any different? A little bit less klipa. Anyone feel that? I ask some people feel it, some people don't. I feel like my neshama personally has less klipa coverings here. So you can connect to the energies more. You feel the energy of Hashem, the revelation much more in Eretz Yisrael. Um, a little bit more, a little bit more. There's still a lot of coverings. Okay, so let us talk about the sense of the month. So my favorite part and every single month on the Jewish calendar, my favorite thing to talk about is the bodily sense of every month because that is the most practical. It's what we can really tap into and work on. And the bodily sense of this month is le'ita. I never knew what le'ita means, but apparently means to taste. To taste. So le'ita means to taste. And um, it's different than eating. I thought the sense of the month was eating, but eating and tasting are different because eating is the more, exter tasting is the more internal part of eating. Um, the more internal experience of eating. It's tasting the it's a more, the eating is more external, tasting is more internal. Now, in eating, we discussed in the beginning of the year that eating takes up a huge 
huge part of our lives. If you would have asked me how many time, how much time of the day do we actually spend eating, what would you say? Nobody said. No, how many? How, actually eating. What do you? How much time do you think you actually spend eating? Seven right. Seven I, the whole day. Actually eating. No, actual eating of the day. Actual eating. How much time of the day do you actually spend eating? An hour max. I don't think anyone. I think moms. I asked my seminary girls. They're like an hour, and I'm like, moms, twenty minutes. Actually putting food in your mouth and chewing it, thirty minutes, right? If you're, it depends how many, like how how busy. <laughs> Right. How long does it take to eat your kids' leftovers? <laughs> um, so, no, I'm kidding. Hopefully we don't do that. So eating the actual food doesn't take very long. But the experience of eating, thinking about it, planning it, preparing it, cleaning up from it, putting it away, buying it, all of that takes a huge percentage of our time, of our waking time. I don't want to, I'm throwing out numbers, but I would say 70 to 90 percent, if not more. Um, even social media, it's all about recipes, food presentation, buying things to make our food look nice when we serve it, and then our body image because of the food that we ate, and dieting and like uh, dieting and exercise and like food, my my and all that because of the food that we ate, or working through the feelings after we eat when we binge and eat, how we feel about it, how bad we feel about ourselves, working through all of the emotions that we feel about our bodies because of the food that we eat. So everything somehow ties down to food. Now, Hashem. This is clearly intentional. We have no reason to feel bad about this because Hashem could have, if he didn't want this to be our experience, Hashem could have made it that we don't have to eat. Hashem could have made it that if we have to eat, we eat one pill a day that nourishes us. Or like it was in the time of the desert. There's food that falls from the sky. We don't have to worry about buying it, or putting it away or preparing it. Food falls from the sky and it tastes like whatever we want. We don't have to go to the bathroom or have digestive issues from it. It could have been like that. But Hashem didn't do it like that. Hashem intentionally didn't want there to be man because he wants this experience for us for whatever reason. Even in Judaism, every single one of the Chagim, well, how do we celebrate every Chag? By eating or by not eating, right? Either we eat or we fast. All of it comes out of the way we celebrate each and every Chag and is by eating. And it doesn't mean it's not something negative. It's it, full, it makes us fully experience the Chag in all of our senses. We're not just commemorating Sukkot. We're eating food in the Sukkah. We're not just commemorating Pesach. We're eating what they ate. We're experiencing their bitterness. It is so. It makes it a real human, tangible experience. On Purim, we celebrate through food, cheesecake, through Shabbos. It's so intentional. Hashem made us humans, and we're meant to live the human experience. So it's not bad that most of our lives revolves around eating. In fact, Sheshit Yom Tavo, we're meant to work the land for seven days. Not only that, not only is eating take up so much of our life, but eating food is actually the source of our, most of our, strugg our, our struggles in life, some of our biggest challenges in life come from the food that we eat. We see this with the very first human being created. What was the first challenge he had in life? The first struggle? They said us with what food he could eat and can eat. They said, uh, Adam said, you can eat this and you can't eat this. That was his first struggle with what he can eat. And Adam, the first human being created in God's image, couldn't resist. And, 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 and we had to have that one food that he was not eating. So the first struggle in human history revolved around food. We're here today in Gullis because Adam and Rishon couldn't require, right? Obviously, that's what's more than that. When you're born in life, what's the first thing you cry for? You work with babies? No? Okay. Well, what's the first thing you cry for when you're born? For food. The very first thing we desire when we're born is food. The very, right? The very, every single thing from the beginning of creation, from the beginning of our existence till the very end revolves around food. And Hashem obviously intended this for this to be. So since food takes up such a huge part of our life, we want to make it the, as meaningful as possible. We want to get the most we can, make the most from that experience since we don't even realize how much, we, since we now realize how much of our life is taken up by this experience. So let's make the most of it. And we'll talk about the five levels of eating and how we can work our way up from the lowest to have a deeper experience when we eat the food. Not not eat because Hashem clearly wants us to eat, but rather to make it something more meaningful. So let's go through the five the five levels. The first level of eating is the um, is the is eating for the sake of eating. That I eat just to eat, and that is the most primitive way of eating. It's, I want to say immature, but not immature in a negative way. Not it's the most primitive, primal way of eating. When a baby is born, he eats for the sake of eating for no other reason at all. And this is like I call it ace of eating. Asa said, eat for the experience of eating. Now, this is not negative. Most of us will start from here, and most of our eating is probably in this area. We just eat because eating, and the end goal is the eating, right? There's no other goal other than the eating. Um, we call I call this like ace of eating um, or binge, and this often, often leads to binging. The opposite of conscious eating is just eating. I mean, most of our eating is because I want to eat. Because the for the experience of eating, I'm not thinking about why I'm eating. I'm eating. Sometimes I eat for other reasons, but for, sometimes I'm eating, and the end goal is the eating itself. So eating to eat is level one. Um, and most of us probably eat a lot in this space, and there's nothing to be ashamed of because this is how we're born. You're born with a natural desire to eat. 
No one tells you, well, you want to eat baby because you're hungry and because it will nourish you and you need this to grow. Otherwise, no one tells you that. You're born with a primal need and a desire to eat. And throughout life, we, our parents and our give us food to make us feel better. I do this all the time. I'm like, oh, you're sad. Here's a food. Here's food. So we also eat to comfort ourselves. So eating becomes not just something to fill ourselves, but also to make ourselves feel better. So eating is um, uh, is a, an end of, of itself, an end, an end in and of itself for many of us. And this is not a negative thing, but we want to try and grow from there to higher levels of eating. And the reason for that is that one of the reasons for that is that when you eat to eat, then it ends up becoming binge eating. That's where binge eating comes in. So the first level is eating to eat and binging. And the reason for that is very deep. So look in your sources. There's a pasuk in the reason that when you eat just for the sake of eating, you're going to end up binging is a pasuk in Mishle that says, Sadik ochel lesoba nafsho ubetun masham tichsor. A tzadik eats to his heart content, to his heart content, but the belly of the Russia of the wicked is always empty. Now, what does that mean? A tzaddik eats and he's full and a Russia will always be empty. What does this mean? And this is really, really deep. The Baal Shem Tov, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the core teachings of Chassidu, based on the Baal Shem Tov's teaching, is that every time we, are, we feel hungry or we are drawn to a certain type of food, there's two things going on. On one level, you're in the mood of that food. But on a deeper level, the Baal Shem Tov says, the reason that you're drawn to a certain food is because your soul wants to elevate the sparks of godliness in that food item. So your soul wants to be nourished by the Kedusha in that food, by the sparks of Kedusha and godliness in that food. Your body wants to be nourished by the nutrient nutrition. And so, that, and that's, he explained, that's why certain people are craving sometimes desire certain foods. Some people like ice cream and, and burgers. Some people like steaks and mac and cheese. What else? Coffee, chocolate, throw them out guys. What are your cravings? What are your sushi, pizza, chocolate, chocolate, Everyone desires different foods. Some people like spicy foods. And the reason that you desire certain foods and other people desire other foods, Baal Shem Tov says, is because every soul is put in this world to elevate the sparks of godliness in the materialism that comes her way. Every one of us is put in certain places in the world, and we each have certain sparks of godliness in the world that are our sparks to elevate. And your neshama is here searching for those sparks, and, all of, and those sparks are hidden in the materialistic objects, in people, in places, in spaces that we are. And that is why... On a detour, just to digress for a second, if you find yourself somewhere random, it's never random. You never, you never, and you never lost somewhere or stuck somewhere. The Rebbe, right? That story from the Rebbe where the women were stuck on the way to the convention one year in a in a snowstorm, and the Rebbe crossed. They sent the Rebbe a letter, and the Rebbe crossed the word "stuck," and he wrote "sent." Because everywhere you end up, you're sent because your soul has sparks of godliness that it needs to elevate, it needs to encounter. And everyone has different sparks that their soul is here to encounter and elevate um, uniquely. So the foods that you're drawn to and the places that you're drawn to, the people that you're drawn to are places of people where your sparks are. That's where your sparks are. And that's the deeper reason that you're drawn to food. And here's where it gets really cool. So knowing that, a tzaddik eats to satisfy his soul. A tzaddik realizes that the reason I'm drawn to food is not just for my body, but also because my soul is hungry. My soul wants those. My soul's not going to be nourished by the food and nutrition. My soul's going to be nourished by the kedusha and everything. Every single physical, every single physical uh, object in the world has godly sparks in it. The god, it actually is only godly sparks. The so what is creating this cup is the words of Hashem that are creating it. It is kedusha. Every single thing. But there's so much klipa that we don't get to see it. And when we use and, and the way that we elevate those sparks. The way that we can extract the godliness from this cup, from the water in this cup, from the coffee that I drank, from the desserts that you made, are by using a mundane object for a higher purpose. By you, by either intending to use it for a higher purpose, by having a higher kavana and in, an intention when you use that thing, or by actually using the energy from that from that object for something deeper, for an inner experience. So any mundane object in this world. So let me backtrack a little bit and talk about what we're talking about. There's sparks of godliness and everything. Our soul is here in this world to elevate her sparks. She, her soul is feminine. Our, her sparks in the world. And when we're drawn to certain things, we're drawn to the sparks of godliness in that thing, in that object, in that experience, in that food. Specifically with food we're talking about, the Baal Shem just says that your soul is drawn to the sparks of Kedusha in it. How does our soul release and receive those sparks of Kedusha in it in that physical object? When she eats it with the intention, with a higher intention, when there's a high, when we take anything mundane in this world, um, it remains neutral. Every mundane physical object that's not evil, that's not us or that's not, um, we'll talk about us or, us or foods that we can eat are because the sparks of spark godliness are a sore, which means trapped. In Hebrew, a sore means imprisoned inside and they can't be released. So we can't eat them because there's nothing higher that will come from it. Only Mashiach comes, we'll be able to release those sparks. Anything mutar in this world, which mutar actually means untied. Matira surim, we say in Davening, to untie the tide, matir asur. Isn't that cool? 
Every day in Davin, we say Hashem unties a surim. So mutar literally means untied. Anything mutar to us means that the sparks of godliness in those are, are not tied in it, that we can release those. And the way we release those is taking anything mutar, anything that's neutral in this world, and utilizing it for a higher purpose. And that reveals the godly intention of why Hashem made it. It says that this water that we drink is waits from the beginning of creation for a person to come and use it for a higher, for make a brach on it, to use it with a higher intention, to use it so we can be nourished to serve Hashem, so I can have energy to be a Jewish mom, Jewish wife, a Jewish human being serving God, to be kind. If I utilize any of the energy in, in the food, if I have the kavana to utilize it for something higher, if we have coffee and we're learning Torah already, right? But it doesn't have to even be that holy. It doesn't have to always be that I'm saying Torah and I'm using this coffee to have energy, godly energy. If I'm eating dinner with my family as a Jewish family and I have the intention that we're eating to nourish this family so we can keep, you know, living, being Jewish examples, um, being making a Kiddush Hashem and living a Jewish life, you're eating now is no longer a mundane act of dinner. Now your dinner is a holy dinner and all of the sparks of Kedusha are now released, are now mutar, are now released back to their source and your neshama is now satisfied and nourished. Your neshama got all the nourishment you needed from that food, from any physical encounter. If you can have more kavana. So anytime you have any intention for the eating, that your eating should be for any higher purpose, that your eating is now for a higher purpose. If you can think about the purpose, which is to release, if even if you're, your purpose, even if you think about the fact that my, I'm releasing the sparks of Kedusha by making a blessing on it, You've now released the sparks and your neshama is now nourished and you're much more satisfied. And that is why, going back to the Pasuk, it says that a tzaddik eats for, uh, what's the Pasuk say? Sov and Afshel. A tzaddik eats to satisfy his soul, so he's always full. Because the reason that you're always hungry and you'll keep binge eating if you just eat to eat, is that you're, if you're eating as a Russia only just to get the sparks, only just to get the food, the taste of the food, then you're going to constantly be hungry because your soul is never satisfied. Because there's a part of you that's needing more, right? You don't usually eat. So when you keep binging to eat, it's not because you're physically hungry. It's because you feel a need. You feel a lack. You feel empty and you're trying to fill that void. That void is your soul wanting the Kedusha in that food that you deprived her of. So if you constantly deprive your soul of the nourishment for her in the food, you'll constantly be hungry and you'll binge until someone takes away the food orders on left, right? Because it's never going to be, you're never going to be satisfied. But if you eat with a higher intention, you'll be full much quicker because you're nourishing what you're really looking for in that food. What you're really needing in that food when you're craving a milkshake or something is the Kedusha in that food, the, the sparks of Kedusha in that food that your soul wants to be nourished, as well as whatever nutrition there might be in that food for your body. But you'll be much more satisfied if you eat to satisfy both your body and your soul. So there has to be a double intention in eating. One is to satisfy your body, to give your body whatever she needs to be full, to be happy. Sometimes you don't eat for the nutrition. Sometimes you eat something to make you happy. And that's okay. And I learned this from Hannah. Literally, Hannah last year gave me, gave us the backing that sometimes eating for our body is not just for nutrition. Sometimes you eat to make yourself joyful. Sometimes you eat something that's not necessarily nutritionally good for you, but you know, it's a special, it's a birthday and you're having a birthday cake. So it's going to make you happy. Or on Friday, I like to treat myself out to a muffin and a coffee to nourish, to, to tell myself I'm worth buying myself something, to give myself self-worth. Sometimes the intention is that you are worthy of buying yourself something to eat right now that's just for you. That's not your kid's leftovers, right? You are worthy of treating yourself out to something. This was really hard for me. I only learned how to buy myself food in a restaurant a couple of years ago. I couldn't do it because my self-worth was so low. So now when I buy something, I don't necessarily even want it, but I want to make sure that I know that I'm worthy of buying myself something and to fill myself up on a Friday when before a really busy day where it's going to be hard. So the intention... Why not even talk about this? <laughs> Where do we get to here? Also for the body and for the that there's double, there's the intention is one to nourish your body or to bring joy to your body, which is, which is um, Jewishly promoted. We eat a lot of food to make us joyful. We eat basar and yain, it says, but that, that uh, eating meat and wine before learning expands your mind. It makes you more expansive. Having wine, it's not nutritionally good, but it makes you besimcha, right? Adla yoda, it makes you be joyful. Sometimes there's a place to eat foods, not only for the nutritional value, but also for the emotional value that it brings to you, whatever substances do for you. Sometimes coffee is for the awakeness. I'm going to have this coffee so I can now be awake, so I can pair my class to learn Torah. There we go. Now that coffee is no longer a mundane coffee. Now my soul received the nourishment it needs from it as well. And it has elevated the coffee. It has elevated my soul. My soul is nourished. So that was the premise for this idea of eating higher level of eating. And this is only still level two, guys. I'm sorry, this is level three. So I skipped to level three. So level one was binge eating and eating to eat, which causes binge eating because you're not eating for a deeper reason. So you're constantly starving for the real reason that you're hungry. And I always talk about this. My favorite, my, my, one of my favorite memes is a girl offering her friend chips. And she's like, no, I'm not hungry. And she's like, 
Susan, it's 12 o'clock at night. I'm not either hungry. I'm eating to fill that bottomless void in my soul. <laughs> like if you're eating at 12 o'clock at night, you're usually not hungry. If you're eating chips at 12 o'clock at night, you feel empty inside and you're eating to fill that void. But ha what happens if you're not intentional about it, then you're gonna keep eating and it's a bottomless pit and you're not gonna feel better. But if you have some sort of kavana, and we'll, we'll jump to this in a moment. So let's go back to, that was level one. Level two is abstaining from food. That a lot of people and, and their lack of being able to control their eating, feeling like they're out of control and we just keep eating and eating and eating and I'm, I can't control myself. The next level is diet culture and abstaining from food. And what people end up doing is trying to fast or abstain from food um, and because they can't control it. Now, this is not bad per se. It's a second level of eating. It's like trying to diet or not eat, but it doesn't deal with the real problem. And the reason that it's not, it doesn't last is that if you're just dieting to diet so that you can control yourself because you can't control your food intake, then it's not gonna last because you're not dealing with the real issue, which is why you keep eating, the emotional reason, the deeper reasons of what's happening on a deeper level of why I'm eating, what I'm trying to fill, and also spiritually nourishing yourself spiritually so that you're actually full from the food that you eat. And so therefore, this second level of, um, distancing yourself from food is like a, a temporary solution. Um, I'm not, there's a time, there's a place for dieting always, but it should always be coupled with one of the higher levels of eating. If dieting is just for the sake of abstaining from food, it's gonna come to a point where, like Kana taught us in this class last year, that if you say that the food is bad, if you write off a food and say no sugar ever, or cut out this food because I can't control myself, there's gonna be a point where you feel restricted and deprived, and then you're gonna end up binging on that food. You're gonna crash and burn, right? So there has to be a balance of learning how to eat and not just avoid the problem, getting to the source of the problem and not just saying food is bad, eating is bad, sugar is bad, cutting out one type of food, right? You never cut out or like, obviously for health reasons, sometimes you have to cut out one type of food, but just for dieting reasons, because you can't control yourself, cutting out a food completely and saying, I'm going to avoid all this food completely. I'm going to fast just for the sake of, um, for the sake of fasting, for the sake of avoiding food because I can't control myself is might seem like it works, but eventually they, they never last. And the reason they don't last is because the, really the only diets that last are the ones that work with you emotionally to understand what's going on in a deeper level. So that brings us to level three, which we already talked about. Level three of eating, so level one is eating to eat. Level two is abstaining from food. It's trying to fix the problem by running away from the problem and just running away from food as much as possible, which hopefully works, but probably will crash and burn. Level three, is eating with a higher intention. And that's what we've been talking about now, that when you recognize the high, that, that this is really level three and four. Level, and I'll divide it into two parts. Level three is eating with the intention to satisfy not just your body, but also your soul. What your soul is looking for in that food. You're desiring a certain food because your soul wants to nourish itself with that sparks. And what I'm gonna say now is that it doesn't always have to be so spiritual and godly. Sometimes on the lowest level, it could even be that I'm eating with a deeper intention of being, making myself feel better right now. Sometimes there's a war going on and things are really, really stressful and it's the end of the day and I had a really rough day and I'm just going to binge on a bag of Sun Buttercups or a bag of Twizzlers or fill in the blanks, guys. Chips, what do we binge on? Chocolate, a tub of ice cream. I'm gonna have this tub of ice cream, but there's a difference. You can have a tub of ice cream in two ways and I learned this from Hannah in her last year's workshop that if you have the tub of ice cream and just eat it and say, oh, I'm such a bad, I'm so bad, I'm so bad, I shouldn't be eating this, I shouldn't be eating this. She, Hannah told me that there's literally studies that show that your body rejects the food and doesn't digest the nutrition that it could have in it and it will be bad for you. But if you eat the same tub of ice cream and say, I'm doing this as an act of love for myself and compassion because I have no other way of, com of comforting myself right now. Today was really, really painful and sad and I'm eating this tub of ice cream to make myself feel better. And this is good for me because this is self-love. This is self-care. I'm eating this as an act of self-care to give myself some love right now because I deserve it because I had a hard day and I deserve this. So it might not be healthy, but this is going to uplift my soul right now. And I'm going to gladly and treat myself for this. And this is what I need right now. Hannah actually said that there's studies that show that you can eat the same type of ice cream. And if you're telling yourself that this is what I need and this is good for me, your body will actually digest nutrition, digest it better and get the nutrition from that it needs from it, whatever you need from it. And, and I've seen personally that if I tell myself I feel bad about this and I'm constantly like hating on myself for eating this when I promised myself I wouldn't, then I end up eating way, way more because I feel worse. So the more bad I feel about myself, the more I need to eat to fill that bad feeling. But if I tell myself, I know I said I'm not gonna eat this, but I had a hard day and this is okay, I'm gonna diet tomorrow. Today, this is what I need. Then I end up, and this is an act of love that I'm doing for myself and I'm eating this with a higher intention of doing self-care and self-comforting. And I'm giving myself this treat and I'm allowing myself to have um, as many as I need until I feel better. I end up eating way less of the Sun Butter Cups and Twizzlers than I, I end up, than I would have had because I'm not feeling bad about it. So the bottomless pit is getting full and I'm actually feeling love. And I'm like, this is an act of love. And I literally now, because of Hana, 
I eat binge less because I'm not trying to binge less. I'm saying I'm gonna eat as much as I need until I feel better, until I'm happy. And I'm, this is not may not be. I'm, I would love to do a better way of self comforting right now, but I don't have a dog, right? And life is hard, and I just need to feel better right now. So you can't always get what you need, right? Well, honey, anything you want to add to what I'm saying? So I feel like I said it good. Okay. Um, because I, it was literally life changing. So eating the same thing and saying, oh, I'm so bad. I'm so bad. And eating and, and instead, and instead eating and saying, this is an act of self love, a self care. Yeah. Eating it in a positive way. But if you get to that point where you recognize that guilt is coming in the picture, then hopefully that's when you can stop because then your body will digest it differently. You're saying your body digests it better when you're open to it. And you're when saying, you're open and you're saying, yeah, this is good. This, this is, is good, good for me. This is what I want. It's not bad. And you know what? So diet could start. It doesn't mean it's the end of your diet. It doesn't mean I'm, that I'm bad now. I'm, uh, it means that tomorrow, I'll, and tomorrow's a new day. It doesn't, doesn't end it, right? And that's something I've had to learn. That tomorrow, I'll start being healthy. Or whenever I'm ready, I'll start being healthy, right? It's okay. My life, you know, when, when I'm ready to, I'll be healthiest. And being healthy is, is, should never come from, this is a side point, dieting should never come from, I'm so disgusting. I need to eat healthier. It should come from, I love myself. I'm worthy of taking better care of myself. And whenever a diet comes from, whenever a, a bad, my, my diets or my inhibitions or my intermittent fasting comes from, I'm disgusting, I need to lose weight or I'm going to throw up, I can't look at myself anymore, none of my clothes fit me. Um, it literally doesn't last a week because it, that's, it's not going it, to, it's not, it's coming from a horrible, because you're going to feel so bad about yourself, you're just going to eat more. But if, it, if you come to a place of learning to love your body that Hashem gave you, each of us, the body that we're meant to have, exactly the body that we're meant to have, Hashem chose our bodies and then did, Hashem doesn't make mistakes. And every one of our bodies is beautiful and precious to Hashem exactly the way it is. And I look at my body and say, this is Hashem's beauty, right? This is what Hashem made. How can I criticize God's art? This is what God wanted. And if I say my body is so beautiful and I am so worthy of caring for myself and giving my body even better care, from there, a diet will last. And it comes from a much higher place. So that's the only place that, uh, that any sort of self-love, if it comes from self-love and self-worth, and it will last. And you say, I'm doing this because I'm worthy of eating healthy. I'm so, I'm so precious. I'm worthy of taking care of my body even better and going out of my way to make healthy food for my body. That's when it will last. This is totally... Uh, I don't even know the word for English. Detour. Okay. There's, there's got to be a better word than detour. Okay. Talk about, it forever. talk about it forever, right? Body, body, health. Okay. So we talked about level one, level two, level three is eating for a higher intention. Even if that deep, even if on the most basic level, that deeper intention is to nourish myself, to give myself some self-love. If I'm eating with an inner intention, not just to eat, to eat, not just the point of eating is never, is not, is, and, and even if it's, I'm eating because I want to have physical energy for blank. What do I need physical energy for? Right for whatever, insert whatever whatever you're doing in your life, which is going to be good and godly, right? Insert whatever godly given thing you're doing. Being a mom is godly. Being a wife is godly. Being a friend is godly. Taking care of yourself, nourishing yourself, whatever it is you need to eat for, insert that. Be more mindful when you're mindful of why I'm eating. So never just say I'm eating to eat. Fill in the um, takeaway is I'm eating to nourish my body. Also try to be cognizant of the sparks of godliness that you're nourishing your soul with. But even if you're eating for another reason, to nourish my body for X and X and X, to make myself joyful for blank, then well, you're eating for a higher purpose. Yeah. Say, like, do I need oh yeah, to... that's what you literally, I, I missed this, but. Do I need to do some work first? Or am I actually, like, am I hungry because I'm not being creative and maybe I could just go be creative and then see if I'm still hungry? Or like check in with the other areas of life before you go to food if you recognize that you're right. not eating for hunger. Right. So there's many ways to fill the need. So sometimes think about what need am I feeling right now of eating? Am I actually hungry? Do I need the nourishment? And sometimes you might not have another way to fill that need besides for food, but be intentional about it and also try and satisfy your soul. Now there's two ways to do that. Tanya in chapters six um, and seven talk all about food and how and physical things and how to extract the godly sparks from it. And there's two ways. One is the way we discussed to eat with intention. Now what happens if you already ate, which happens all the time, we ate our food already, and now I, shoot, I and forgot to have an intention. Like an I forgot. Experience. I didn't. I forgot because I was starving, and I just ate whatever I saw. I binged. So what happens when you binge? You came in your kitchen. There's leftovers or something on the counter, and you just ate it without any intention. You ate to eat. Is it too late? The altar says, "No, not at all. It's not too late." Retroactively, what do you do retroactively? So best case scenario, you're intentional when you sit down to eat. You're like, "Why am I eating? I'm eating for higher intention," and you end up being satisfied. You're not. You're not hungry and hungry. You're satisfied. What happens if you already ate? How could you now elevate those sparks of godliness in that food? What you do retroactively is he says is that you use the energy from the food that you ate for something positive. So if I already ate without eating the intention, the altar says, fine. So I ate this coffee. Now 
um, now I could be intentional and say, look, I'm, the coffee that I drank and all the things I ate this morning are giving me energy now to teach a shear. You got energy to come to a shear. You have energy now to be a mom, to do whatever it is that you do, to do your work, to spread the world with light, to be a kind person, right? Whatever it is that you're doing in life, if you're intentional afterwards about the energy, what you're using the energy for, you've now retroactively elevated the sparks of trapped that were that were mutar in those things that were untied and you've returned them to their source. You've allowed those sparks to um, be released and to reveal, what does it mean the sparks released in a practical way? It means you've revealed the higher intention and purpose of that physical food that it was created for. You revealed its divine intent and now it connects to its godly intent. Your soul is now way more nourished when you have intent afterwards. Or even if you didn't have intent, if you actually use the food that you ate, the energy from the food that you ate for something positive, your soul is elevated and your soul is nourished from that. It works better if you're intentional much better when you're intentional. So that was levels three and four. Levels three was eating for a higher intention, being more intentional about what you eat for a higher purpose to satisfy your soul also, to nourish whatever it is in your soul that you need from that food to get the sparks of Kedusha. And level four was using the energy from the food for something divine, for a higher purpose, for something positive in the world. Now, that brings us to level five, which is like crazy because you're like, this is the highest level I could eat of, right? I'm eating for divinity, elevating the food. Like what could be higher than this? I was shocked when I found out there's an even higher level than that. So the reason there's a higher level is because all these levels until now are that the food is for a separate reason. The eating itself is for another reason, to get the sparks that you need from the food. But the actual eating itself is just the secondary, you know, what you need to do to get the sparks. Now, the fifth level tells us this pasuk. Look at your sources. There's a pasuk in Tehilim that says, Tamu re'u kitob havaya ashrei hagever yechsabo. Anyone know what that means? Taste and you will see that God is good. Tamaruki Tobavaya. Taste and you will see that Hashem is good. Ashri Hagever Yechsebo. Blessed is the is the man that Yechsebo. That I don't know what Yechsebo. Yeah. Resides there. What? That resides there. That resides there. Sounds good. I trust you. I trust you, Cindy. Um, so what does this mean? On a on a on the on the basic level, this pasuk the translation of this pasuk means that taste and you'll see that God is good. And sometimes people don't realize the beauty of Torah, the beauty of Judaism until you taste it and you get a taste of it and you're like, wow, this is amazing. How did I not have Shabbos until now? When you really taste the inner energy, inner, what it means to have a Shem in your life, what it means to have a moon in your life, what it means to have a in your life, you suddenly realize how beautiful it is and how you're lacking and you see how good it is and you get that good taste and you're like, wow, I want I want this forever. So that's what the what's on one level. On a deeper level, Hasidah says on another level, Te'amuru Kutobabaya means taste and you will see. Taste the food that you eat, literally taste the things in life that are physical, that taste good. I need one of your foods to demonstrate. Dessert. No, you're, oh, you have your desserts there? When you taste food, um, taste the food in life, and you will see that what the good is, what is the good taste? When you taste something good, I already made a broth earlier. Uh, when you taste the, the sweetness of them, the good flavor in it, and you recognize he told the goodness in it is Havaya, is the godliness in it. This is divine. That's what it means to say that this is divine. This tastes divine. That's what it the highest taste. level is. Not that I'm eating for a higher purpose. That the actual goodness, that flavor in it that I'm tasting is divinity. My grandfather, Allah Shalom, always used to say, and I've shared this many times, that Hashem could have made one color of food, one flavor of food. Many times, let's say, I mean, all the food tastes the same and have one color and flavor. But Hashem, in His love for us, in His divinity and in His artistic, in the artisticness of how Hashem made the world, our artistry, created infinite pleasure, infinite tastes, infinite flavors, infinite colors for our pleasure, because we actually know that the color of food affects our pleasure of food. Hashem created this in his divinity for us to enjoy, for the pleasure. And so when we're what we're actually tasting, when we taste goodness and sweetness and flavor is divinity. Only God, I always say about the mango, like this is God, this is God's, my kids call it now, because I mean God's candy, Hashem's candy. It, my, literally, my baby will say, can I have Hashem's candy? And so I'm like, who could, no human could replicate such a taste of like a good mango. If you've ever had a really good mango, it's just divine. So what you're actually tasting is Hashem's divine creativity. You're like, this is divine. And that goes for every physical thing in the world. If you have something delicious, you're like, this is divine. You experience a beautiful scene, a beautiful nature. This is divine. So you're not only, you're not saying I'm going to eat this for a higher purpose. The experience itself is godly. I'm seeing godliness. When I look at a beautiful person, I'm seeing God. I'm seeing the God in you. So if you can actually use your eyes to see the divinity and taste, that's what this whole experience of tasting is. The taste, the divinity, and the food that you eat and realize that you're experiencing the divinity, you're tasting God's in infinity, and you see Hashem's infinity through the infinite flavors that He makes, through the infinite world Hashem made. Through His beauty, you get to that's how we see God. It says, Me, 
from the world we get to perceive Hashem. How do you see God through his artistry? We see his artwork. So we know that Hashem has created the world because no human could create the nature that we experience, the world that we experience, the infinite flavors that we experience. It can never be, rep it can never be created in the lab um, unless you use Hashem as original flavors um, and extract it from that. So there, when we experience the infinity of Hashem's world, that's when we experience Hashem's infinity and self and we appreciate. So my grandmother taught me that when I eat the flavors, I just appreciate Hashem's infinite love for me and a love for every person in the world that Hashem created these pleasures for us to enjoy only for, it says Hashem created infinite pleasures just for our enjoyment. So to tap into the divinity inherent in the food that you're eating and to say, wow, like, thank you Hashem for creating this. Hashem, you're you're wonderful. You're you're amazing. You created these beautiful flavors for me. Thank you, Hashem. So try and have an inner experience of eating. And that means eating a little bit slower, which is hard. I eat very quickly. It means tasting the food a little bit longer, letting the food sit on your tongue, experiencing that taste, and we'll end up being a lot fuller from that as well. Because when you're tasting the divinity in it, you're nourishing your body, you're nourishing your soul. You're more full because you're actually getting something divine in that experience. You're getting the divinity in that experience. So let us all appreciate the start saying this is divine more. And when you say this is divine, Think about what that means. It means it's godly. This is literally divine. Only God could have created this. So say, try to use the word divine in this month. Try to tap into the inner experience of eating. Um, did I forget to say that the shir is in memory and in schut of the um, the two soldiers from the Gush that were um, brutally and sadly um, died fighting in the war in Gaza today and yesterday. Um, so the shir is in honor of Elkana Newlander and... David Schwartz, may the Neshamas have a blessing, may Shem comfort their family, and may we have to never ever do this again, and we know no more Tsar, this Shem should end this war with the coming of Mashiach. Um, thank you so much for joining. Um, one more cool thing is that on Shabbos, going back to this elevating food, on Shabbos, we don't actually have to have any kavana because on Shabbos, there's a mitzvah to eat food and enjoy food on Shabbos, I eat delicious food on Shabbos, so the elevation of food happens automatically on Shabbos. So even if you're eating to eat on Shabbos, automatically your soul is nourished from that food. You get nourished because there's an elevation of the world on Shabbos and the food itself is nourishing for your soul. So anything you eat on Shabbos, even if you're not even intending to it, automatically becomes elevated. Your neshama gets satisfied from it. The sparks are automatically released on Shabbos, which is really cool because a Shabbat is connected to the word Shabbos because I know you guys get annoyed, but the test and tough are interchangeable. So Shabbat and Shabbos come from the same Lashon. Also, because the Tzaddik, it says the Sova, the idea of, of fullness that the Tzaddik has, is from the word sova and sheva are the same thing. So on Shabbos, on sh is on the seventh day of the week, sheva, and the word sova, which is full. So on Shabbos, we have true fullness and satisfaction and sova on the seventh day because of this inherent elevation of sparks that happens. There's another connection of tzaddik to the month of Shabbos, but um, just a sec, a sec. It says it's in the form of a tree. I guess it's a letter of the month of tzaddik. But anyways, so yeah, that was the, the idea of Shabbos, shva, and all that connection. One more thing that Shvat, the reason that historically this idea of elevating food in Shvat goes back thousands of years, at least hundreds of years. I don't want to, but there's a fast called Shovavim. Raise your hand if you've heard of Shovavim. Who knows what Shovavim means? Yeah? Shin. Exactly. Shovavim is an acronym for Shemos Ve'era Bo B'Shalach Yisro Mishpatim. And this is a historical time that Jews have always elevated these, these partios. So what is Shovavim? Shovavim is a fa intermittent fasting that the Jewish people have done for hundreds of years. On Mondays and Thursdays, they don't, they haven't, they, they didn't eat on these parshios, Shab, Shmos, Erebo, Bashal, Chesar, Mishpatim. And those are always happen during the months of Shabbat when we're elevating and refining our inner connection to food because this is our time to do it. What fasting is just to abstain from something, to get away from something, then it's, it's not necessarily good. But when it's to deepen your connect to, um, come back to food, the point, if the point of fasting is so that when you eat, you are eating more mindfully, then fasting is amazing. So fasting Monday, if you'd like to sponsor or share, please sponsor. But most importantly, if you enjoyed this year, share it with your friends and leave a comment that just says, hi, Kiki. That's my challenge to you this week. So I know that I'm not talking to nobody.